So thank you very much for coming in such nice number. My name is Van Kruzin, I teach genetics here at uh, Augustana. And uh, last November happened something which uh, shook entire uh, scientific community, but not just scientific community, basically humankind uh, across the world. And that was event when in, in China, one uh, researcher, geneticist, genetically modified human embryos, and those babies, twin sisters, Lulu and Nana, are, uh, were born, so they're first genetically modified humans. And uh, I will give you a little bit more information about the event. Um, as scientists, I'm not going to talk much about the ethics of it, so I'll leave that to Janet. And uh, after the presentations, I hope that we'll have enough time uh, for questions and discussion. So, since I'm a professor, I like to teach, and we cannot just jump to, to genetic modification. We need first to know a little bit about <laughs> DNA. And uh, DNA is genetic blueprint. As you know, all of us in our cells, we do have DNA. And that DNA is basically a genetic program, some sort of software, which tells our cells what to do and how to do. Now, when you watch science fiction movies or some thrillers or something about scientists and genetics, you usually see on, the, on those screens and computers double helix like DNA. But with geneticists, really are not much concerned about double helix. So in real science, you don't see that. Okay? So that's just in movies, that's Hollywood. <laughs> what we're concerned is the information which is in the DNA, the sequence which tells cells what to do. And uh, when you isolate DNA and run it on gel, uh, it looks something like this. So it's nothing particularly interesting before you really go on the molecular level and uh, you unlock the information which is there. So in our cells, we have about 3.6 billion nucleotides, which are single letters of DNA, and that double helix actually has two by two letters together in each of our cells, and we have it in two copies. Uh, and these letters are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosin, and uh, adenine and thymine always pair together with a double bond, uh, guanine and cytosin with triple bond. Therefore, if you have only one strand of DNA based on complementarity, you know what is in the other strand. And based on that principle, we actually can reproduce. We can reproduce ourselves with, uh, within our body, but we also can procreate and reproduce next generation. Thanks to the capability of DNA to pres preserve genetic information, but also to make copies of itself. So that is our genetic blueprint, and that is what scientists affected in the experiment that I'm going to mention. We need to know one more thing before, uh, before I talk more uh, about uh, these, uh, these babies, and that is genetic information, DNA, is just linear uh, information. And when you observe real biological things, they're three-dimensional. So we have three dimensions, we, we have our bodies. So how we make our bodies? Uh, that linear information has to become three-dimensional, so they are made of proteins. Proteins are machines which are actually coded by DNA. So within DNA, there, there is information which will be transcribed into RNA molecule, which is just messenger, which takes the same information from the nucleus in our cells into our cytoplasm where proteins will be assembled. And proteins are basically the products of 3D printers, which we call ribosomes. So now we have technology which we can compare, uh, analogies which we can make thanks to high technology. Basically, in each of our cells, we have thousands of these 3D printers, ribosomes, which then using information from <laughs> DNA, make proteins, and proteins do different functions in our body. So that is how we get our three-dimensional bodies. Now, everything which is in, in the DNA, 
will affect proteins. So the central dogma of molecular biology tells that the, the line of information always goes from DNA toward protein. Therefore, if you would like to make change, real change, which is inheritable, you need to change DNA, not proteins. You change DNA, you get the change in the proteins. So that is uh, that ultra super fast course of molecular <laughs> genetics that you needed. But there's a little bit more about technology of recombinant DNA, uh, which is available from 70s, and the Nobel Prize for it was assigned in the 70s. Amazingly, these days, uh, second year biology students do that technology in our labs. So uh, science really progresses fast, but that is old technology now. Uh, however, it helps us to understand uh, this new technology, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which was used to genetically modify, uh, modify humans. So basically, you can use DNA, and in this case, it's circular DNA, it's still double helix, but that double helix is closed in the circle, uh, you can use different molecular scissors, which we call restriction enzymes, which cut DNA on the exact sequence. Among these 3.6 billion letters, that sequence is preserved. And the uh, sequence of letters uh, can be recognized by these scissors. So there is about 200, maybe more, uh, isolated scissors from different microorganisms. And these scissors can cut DNA, and then you can recombine DNA of different organisms. You isolate DNA from one species, and from another species, you cut it with the same scissors, and then you get sticky ends because of complementarity of DNA. You know A and T recognize each other, C and G recognize each other. Therefore, you can recombine DNA molecules from different species. And uh, you can grow them in the, in the bacteria, like in E. coli. So that is old technology, which is sufficiently powerful to give us genetic modification. Just to show you one example, uh, the gene from jellyfish and from some other organisms which have, for example, bioluminescence, they can produce light. Uh, you can transfer their gene into a completely different organism using this recombinant DNA. And uh, these pigs look pretty much normal, with the exception that the, their noses are a little bit yellowish, but when you put them uh, in the dark, they're actually fluorescent. They're glowing, and uh, I call them, call them Halloween pigs. <laughs> It's genetic modification which allows us to place genes from different species and recombine them. Now, what happened in China in November is not placing the genes from different species, but you can use the same technology of cutting out genes or adding genes within the species. You can enhance some features of species, you can eliminate some sequences, in other words, you can do editing. It's like having text, so you can edit that text using different scissors. Uh, the technology which was used, uh, that Cas9, CRISPR Cas9, was published in 2013 and was discovered uh, in the uh, 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 University of Harvard. And this, this guy, George Church, is amazing. Uh, and probably leading geneticists today in the world, but we can argue that maybe he gave us technology similar to atomic bombing in physics. So uh, we'll see what, what future will, will tell, but basically in, in their abstract, they defined the meaning of actually abbreviation for that technology, CRISPR-Cas9, which stands for, for uh, Clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. Uh, now, what that means, I'm not going to go into details, but this is a groundbreaking paper from 2013, published in Nature Methods, where they gave us this technology. And technology is in broad use, 
I'm not going to go into detail and explain exactly how everything works, but you use molecular scissors, same as with restriction enzymes. However, restriction enzymes have the limitation because you can hit only sequence which is already there and you have limited number of scissors that you can use with regular uh, genetic recombination uh, technology, the DNA recombinant technology. Here, what is different, you're using small, small RNA molecule which you can artificially synthesize. And as you remember, DNA, RNA protein so the uh, RNA is messenger, which is complementary to DNA. So basically you can design which sequence you would like to target. Any sequence of any organism, now we have the ability to edit it. So you just design proper RNA molecule and scissors are attached to that RNA molecule and they will cut DNA and then later either through homologous recombination or non-homologous end joining, which is DNA repair mechanism, you can either add some new sequence or replace sequence within the DNA, or you can delete it. So we have now very powerful technology. So this is, I'm not sure exactly if I pronounce it well, uh, Dr. Hei Yanghui, who uh, presented his research uh, in Hong Kong in November last year, and that was like world news. So he just, you know, had a presentation of his research, and he said, you know what, I, I just genetically modified some human babies. And <laughs> that's really a scary thing, but I paraphrase basically. But uh, the thing is, you have to have justification. And his justification for this research was that. Uh, Babies uh, got one deletion, one mutation within the DNA in the gene CCR5, which is recognition entry point for HIV virus. Therefore, these genetically modified babies are resistant to HIV, HIV. And that was the justification. He did that outside of the university in the secrecy However, um, there are some issues, besides ethical issues, that I would like to address before uh, I give, uh, give word to Janet. Uh, first thing is that he did that, allegedly, to help babies whose father is HIV positive, to be sure to get babies which cannot get uh, infection. However, uh, he must have known that the same gene that he mutated in these babies, CCR5, uh, is known to enhance mental capability in mice. So it's, I would say it's, you know, um, there is more than what is on the surface. Uh, we can discuss that, I cannot prove or disprove that he had deeper intentions but it is known for a long time uh, that uh, China had very relaxed uh, regulations about uh, the research in this field. Now they're tightening it because the entire world uh, reacted. But for a long time, many scientists from North America, Europe would go to China and do, do research in some gray areas. Um, so the question is, is maybe the, the real intention to uh, genetically enhance these babies to increase their mental capabilities or to make some superhumans, if you like. Now, there are some other problems of technical nature. When you use this CRISPR technology, you target certain sequence using that RNA. But in our 3.6 billion letters in that book, which if you put that in real books, that would be about 500 volumes, 500 pages each volume. So it's really difficult to grasp the amount of information we have in ourselves. And within that vast amount of information, your RNA, guiding RNA, 
will hit some targets non-intentional. So you do not just introduce the change where you would like to make it, you can make off-target impacts uh, in the nature, which can be genetic modification of sequences you did not plan to genetically modify, but also we lack knowledge of the interactions between the genes. So that is another aspect that we don't know. Basically, we are playing with the things we do not understand well. And uh, the last thing <laughs> that, uh, that you need to know is that uh, gene therapy exists from 80s. Gene therapy is the methodology in which you try to replace mutated gene with healthy gene, but people did that in somatic cells, in our bodily cells. However, besides somatic cells, we have our germline cells. And germline cells are the cells that we send to the next generation. So those are sperm and egg cells, which will produce next generation. And the problem is that in the case of these two babies, Lulu and Nana, uh, genetic modification was done on stem cells. So stem cells are early cells which have the capability to produce any tissue in our body. So early embryos were tampered, and in these early embryos, there are also stem cells which will produce germline. Therefore, these babies are genetically modified, not just somatically, not just for their generation, but they, uh, uh, they now carry genetic modification which they will pass to the next generation if they get uh, their children. So that is the problem about that. And the last thing, just a little piece of advice as geneticists, you know people are concerned about identity theft, and you know when your credit card is stolen, you immediately call you know, to cancel it and stuff. The thing is you can replace your credit card, but you cannot replace your DNA. You have your DNA for whole life. And everywhere now are advertisements to do all these kinds of cool analysis to see about your origins and stuff. Uh, I would suggest, on my humble opinion, uh, that's a risky game to play. If you give your DNA, uh, you know, it's very difficult to erase it. So some people try to revoke it, but uh, it's very, very difficult. So uh, even if it's partially done, that DNA remains in the possession of somebody, and you, that is your genetic identity. Mm -hmm. So let's not just think about others, think about yourself and your family, and try to protect as much as you can uh, your genetic identity as you do that in different ways. Thank you very much. to adopt my position or tell you what I think, but I'm going to raise some um, issues that we need to consider when we're thinking about, ethically thinking about um, genetic engineering. So there's ethical issues with any kind of um, gene editing, but let's uh, point out what uh, Tom brought up. In the case of somatic gene therapies, that involves modifying um, a person's DNA to either treat or cure a disease caused by a genetic mutation. Um, and these are the three ethical issues that are involved. In somatic uh, gene therapies, the scientist can get the person's informed consent. Um, the gene editing affects only their particular body, so only one body. And finally, the intent of somatic gene therapy is to fix or um, ameliorate an existing condition. In other words, it's therapeutic, okay? And these are exactly the issues that need to be uh, considered when um, we look at germline editing. First, I'll just point out to people that getting informed consent is a fundamental principle in bioethics. We shouldn't do to someone, so, um, sorry, we shouldn't do something to someone 
against their will or in their ignorance. And we see this principle at work on how we have written, written laws around uh, medical treatment. The patient always has a right to refuse. Uh, in the laws we've written around um, medical assistance and dying, people have to be competent to consent. Uh, the laws we have around and participating um, in um, experiments, people have to consent and they have to have enough information to know what it is that they are consenting to. And in fact, we see the importance that we give consent um, in society in general. We think that it's wrong to have sex with somebody who has not consented. We think that it's wrong to use somebody's, to use Tom's example, to use somebody's data if they haven't consented to it. So now, germline editing, right, consists of altering the genome such that it affects all the cells, because it affects stem cells, and stem cells can make any kind of, a, any kind of cells. Um, and it also um, makes these um, alterations heritable because it includes affecting the um, potential sperm or potential egg. So, germline editing consists of editing the genes of an embryo. So here's our problem. Obviously, embryos cannot consent. That's the first problem. So, some people have argued that, well, you know, parents can consent to editing an embryo because, after all, parents often consent to all sorts of things on behalf of their child. Well, the first thing that I would suggest is we need to ask how informed parents can be given the novelty of this therapy and given its complexity, but I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. The bigger issue here has to do with the uniqueness of germline editing as a process. It's true that parents do consent on behalf of their children, right? And we see nothing morally suspect or um, unreasonable when they do so. So parents consent to medical procedures for their children, they sign them up for French immersion, they get their ears pierced, all sorts of things. But germline editing is different because first, germline editing is permanent. Okay? Once it's done, consent cannot be withdrawn. And it is pervasive. In other words, it's total. Remember I said, Tom said, it affects every single cell in the body. So, you know, we do consent on behalf of our children, but we expect that as a child gets older, they'll gradually be able to give their own consent. First, in concert with their parents, and then eventually by themselves. And in virtually all the examples that I um, gave you, um, it's true that uh, in some of my examples, what's done is done. But you can, for example, quit French immersion. You can let your piercings grow over, uh, grow closed. But if your genetic makeup has been changed as an embryo, you can't change it back. And it's a fundamental, it's a fundamental chain. So this brings me to uh, a second issue. Not only is germline editing permanent at a fundamental level, it actually affects more than one body. Right? Or at least I should put it this way, it affects more than one body if that child then chooses to go on and have children of their own. Right? So in other words, the permanent genetic changes made to the embryo are passed down or inherited by any future offspring. So what this means is that when a parent gives consent for their embryo to be edited, she or he is not just consenting on behalf of their child, they're not just consenting for their child, they're consenting for their child's children and for those children's children and so on and so forth. It's permanent in a way that consenting to having your child's ears pierced or having their tonsils out, taken out, is not. So germline editing is an example of an individual uh, decision made by an individual about their individual family, but it has species-wide effects. And these species-wide effects are permanent and they're enduring. 
So in other words, if these um, gene-edited children have children, it will affect eventually the entire human species. Okay. Um, what about the third issue I mentioned, which was that somatic gene editing is therapeutic to fix or ameliorate an existing condition, but ger germline editing is what philosophers call an enhancement of a genome. Is that what you biologists call it as well? An enhancement? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, germline editing is not to fix something, but it's rather it's to improve the genes. It's not always easy to see this, but let's take a look at the case of the Chinese baby. So as Tom pointed out, their germline was edited to make them HIV resistant. It wasn't to fix something, it was to prevent something. It's an enhancement because what was edited was a gene that makes them HIV resistant. And this gene, by the way, appears, uh, it's pretty rare, but it does appear naturally in some people. So you might say, well, who could object to that? It's a good thing to be HIV resistant. And I would say, yes, it is. And now I'm going to, um, I'm going to engage in some exaggeration, right? I'd say, yeah, it is good to make a baby HIV resistant. In fact, since it's such a good thing, shouldn't we make all babies HIV resistant? Shouldn't we insist, in fact, that all babies be artificially conceived so that we can edit out all the genes that we think are harmful and enhance all the genes that we think are beneficial? And any parent who refuses to do this clearly doesn't have their child's best interests at heart. And, you know, then you're not fit to be a parent. See, I ask those rhetorical and exaggerated questions, right? I'm being deliber deliberately provocative and extreme because allowing gene enhancement leads us to consider eugenics, right? I'm not saying that enhancement um, causes us to become eugenists, but I'm saying that enhancement, gene enhancement, opens the door to eugenic arguments. And we have to be prepared to discuss eugenics and prepared to discuss where we're gonna draw the line. Okay. So we might decide we'll allow um, editing, gene editing to prevent debilitating diseases, but then should we also maybe allow gene editing to um, prevent the potential to develop diabetes? Which by the way, we're not even close to doing because diabetes is um, the result of a number of different genes as well as, you know, um, environmental factors. Okay. Um, basically, it comes down to if we will prevent, if we want to, if we allow gene editing to prevent diseases, which we could possibly do, then are we going to allow editing to make our children whatever, smarter, faster, stronger? All right. We have the technology. Um, and if, as well, if we allow individual people to make individual choices about their individual family, will we then disapprove of and censure parents who don't make the same decisions about their family? There's also a little issue, I'm just going to mention it in a sentence, and if somebody wants to bring it up, you can talk about it, but there's also the issue of these um, therapies are expensive. So there's also issues of access to these kinds of therapies. Okay, so where does this leave us? One of the uh, fundamental press principles in bioethics is first do no harm. Right? This principle takes a slightly different form in environmental ethics because germline editing has environmental effects. It's not just about humans, or it's, sorry, it's not just about the individual human. It shades into environmental ethics. And the fundamental, the, the form that first do no harm principle that takes in environmental ethics is the precautionary principle, which is that the introduction of a new process or a product whose ultimate effects are in dispute or unknown should be resisted. So in other words, this fits in with what Tom was talking about, about how little we know 
about what it is that we're capable of doing. Okay? So in other words, when we don't know the ultimate effects of a new process or a new product, we should exercise caution at least to the extent that we're reasonably sure that we're not going to cause harm. In the case of um, germline editing, we already know some of the risks. We know that there's a very high risk of off-target impacts, as Tom is pointing out. Um, we also know the effects, whether they're good or bad, but we also know that the effects are gonna be permanent. We also know that whether uh, we do not agree about what counts as eugenics, we know that the effects whether they're good or bad, are gonna affect the entire human species, not just that individual child or their individual family. So, one of the things that I found most distressing about what happened in China is those parents, when they were giving consent to have this done to their embryo, they were consenting on behalf of all of us, right? But it's easy to see this as, well, it's purely individual because it was their embryo, right? But it's our species. So one thing that I would suggest is that it has to be a social decision. So uh, this is the situation we're facing and in which we have to make ethical decisions as individuals and as a society. We have very little knowledge, particularly with regards to long-term future effects, and secondly, the consequences of making a mistake are permanent, and they're going to be species-wide. <clears throat> so the stakes are really high. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, my name's Neil Holke, and I'll <coughs> help you field the questions for, for Janet and Tom. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know that was really great, both of you. Um, I really like the way you set up criteria for evaluating ethically whether or not this, this is, in fact, this action is ethical. But I'm, I'm just curious because industrial agriculture has been modifying genes and non human animals for some time. Tom showed that picture of the whole human face. How does an ethicist, using similar criteria, draw a distinction between a non human animal?
uh, until 1977, they would uh, force to sterilize certain categories of, yeah. of people. Um, we had that case also in Canada similarly. Um, the other problem is, so more and more, that is something which is not acceptable uh, in terms of sterilization of people. However, we still do it uh, through artificial fertilization in vitro. Before the implantation of embryo, there's always pre-screening. And if there's something wrong, that embryo will be discarded. So now we just do that on the level of embryos. But it's still, eugenics is still going on. Right. 
we do have exponential growth of knowledge, but we do not have exponential growth of ethics. Well, and I'll, I'll just put another little twist on that. Because sometimes, I don't feel this way, but sometimes ethicists get irritated that they say we don't have enough ethical, or that we don't have ethical knowledge, or we do have lots. The problem is we don't all have the same ethics. Take uh, the other side of the coin, you know, um, where if we have the tech, we, 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 have the te we have the technology and we've used it to remove um, smallpox from our society, right? If we have the technology to remove something like Huntington's from our society, aren't we more like obligated to do it? Yeah, that was exactly what I was saying, that this is what, and so it's partly this um, eugenics. This is what we, we have to be prepared that that's what we open ourselves up to. So that, for example, um, I'll use a really contentious example, but um, there are some people now who would say, if you um, are pregnant and you know you're having a Down syndrome baby, you have a moral obligation to not bring it to term, right? So with Huntington's, I totally get it, but we have to be prepared then to talk about, well, are we going to allow some people uh, who, for whatever reason, object to having their embryo tested for Huntington's, or they don't object to that, but they will not, they will They will carry it to term. Yeah. I, I think it's complicated too when you start talking yeah. about the, the genome interactions. I can't forget what genetic disease it is, but there's one debilitating, physical debilitating genetic disease that's associated with high intelligence. Mm -hmm. So if you get rid of that, you will also get rid of the other thing too. And I think it's kind of saying, you know, we don't know everything about the genome yet and how it interacts. So, in response to some of these questions, I'm curious to hear each of you mention quickly what, what has been the history of ethical thinking along these lines, because as both of you pointed out, this is not new technology. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to do this has been around for a long time. We knew it was coming to this, and I agree with Tim, the cat's out of the bag. It's going to keep happening. Mm -hmm. This technology is going to continue to advance whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. So over the last 30 to 40 years, as this technology has developed, what has the scientific community said about the ethics of this? Have international organizations made official statements about oh, yeah. higher EVs? And so how has that unfolded? I know that's a big question. I'll just say uh, one technical thing about human embryos. Whether you do research in stem cells or some other related, uh, related area, you can do research in most of the countries, you can do research on human embryos until two, two weeks old. Because consent uh, is that uh, these embryos can produce single human, but also can split in one But means, therefore, it's not defined if it's human or not. And uh, I mentioned that in my, my classes in genetics. Uh, I don't understand that uh, you know, justification, and I do not accept that justification, but that is the practice. So in most countries, people do experiments on, on embryos up to two, two weeks old, then they do abortion. Uh, my, my point is, okay, so you kill at least one human, future human being, or maybe more, and they'll all be twins, right? So I don't see that justification, but that is practical in which is going on. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, the fellow who developed this church um, is at Harvard, and so Harvard, after uh, the news broke from China, Harvard um, uh, put out a little slim volume um, where they have some of their own faculty, so they're bioethicists, people from medicine, so on and so forth, and they're the, uh, responding to this, and their the consensus seems to be um, proceed with caution. We have regulations where there's a, some really enormous benefits, potential benefits to this, um, but there are regulations around it, and we have to proceed very cautiously. But, but there is also another aspect of it, and it's political opinion which goes with it. So you have liberals, you have conservatives. Harvard and Berkeley are in liberal places, or as they say, Democrat in, in the United States. Uh, in some other places, if, if you ask uh, an addicts, they would say it's not acceptable, you know. But since uh, this is so high, highly respected place, Harvard, uh, 
it matters what they say, I would not agree, you know, proceed with cautious. I would not agree with that as a geneticist, but that is probably what's going to happen. We're out of time. Um, so fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you.